Hello, everyone, and welcome to this evening's broadcast. Um, we're having a conversation with author Danielle Dreilinger about her 2021 book, The Secret History of Home Economics, How Trailblazing Women Harnessed the Power of Home and Changed the Way We Live. My name is Laura Jackson, and I'm here at the Yellow Farmhouse Education Center, which is a nonprofit organization based on Stoneacres Farm in Stonington, Connecticut. Our mission is to connect people to each other and to where their food comes from through food and farm-based education. And we do um, a fair amount of work in the area of family and consumer science, offering professional development to family and consumer science teachers and hosting field trips, uh, students who are in culinary classes. So we're very excited about this book and about tonight's program. Thank you all for making time um, on a presumably busy weeknight uh, to join us. And um, if you are joining live, we would love to know where you're joining from um, and give you a chance to get comfortable with the chat feature. So please introduce yourselves and let us know where you're joining from and what drew you to tonight's program. Um, maybe you're a family consumer science teacher, or maybe you took home ec when you were in school. Um, maybe you really love to cook or you love history. So we're interested in knowing um, what attracted you. And while you're doing that, I want to give you a quick sense of what to expect from the program tonight. So in a moment, I'll introduce Danielle, and she's going to begin with a short presentation of just some of the highlights from her book. Um, we know that some of you are reading it now, and some of you may have read it already, and some of you are going to read it after tonight's program. Um, and then she and I um, will chat a bit. I have a few questions that I have after reading the book. Well, actually, I have many questions after reading the book because I found it very interesting. Um, but those of you who are joining us live, we really encourage you to submit your questions as well. And um, you can do that at any time, but we'll be reserving time at the end of the uh, program for those questions. And um, tonight's program, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, tonight's program is made possible by Connecticut Humanities. Um, they have funded this Community Reads project which also includes a program this Saturday at two o'clock at Stonington High School. And that's going to be a cooking class led by three local family and consumer science teachers, which if you don't know is uh, sort of the, the new name for home economics. And they're going to be giving us a glimpse into what a family and consumer science class or what a culinary class looks like today. Um, so that's gonna be a lot of fun and I'll, I'll mention it again at the end of the program. And if you have questions, please let us know. Uh, this series, of course, was inspired by Danielle's book, as I said, The Secret History of Home Economics, How Trailblazing Women Harness the Power of Home and Change the Way We Live. Um, and this book really uh, taught me so much about where this field came from and how it evolved over time and how much it's influenced our culture. Um, so if you haven't had a chance to read it yet, I encourage you to do so, and you can find it wherever you buy books, but you can also find it at the Stonington Free Library, the Mystic No Ink Library, and the Public Library of New London. Um, that was part of this funding from Connecticut Humanities as well. So we thank them for that. Danielle Dreilinger is an American South storytelling reporter for the Gannett USA Today Network. Before moving to Durham, North Carolina, where she now lives, she was a 2018 Knight Wallace Journalism Fellow at the University of Michigan, and worked for the New Orleans Times-Picayune, WGBH News, and the Boston Globe. She's won numerous awards for her education coverage, including the Louisiana Press Association's Best Features Writer Honor, and has re received <clears throat> excuse me, project fellowships from the Robert B. Silvers Foundation, the Education Writers Association, and the Institute for Citizens and Scholars. She began her journalism career covering arts for several outlets, including WBUR, where she was part of the team that won the station's first online journalism award. Her work has appeared in publications ranging from The Atlantic to Plowshares to No Depression, among many others. She holds a bachelor's degree at summa cum laude from Columbia University. And perhaps my favorite part of her bio is a fan of cats, knitting, books, history and change, people who are left out, the way we live now and what makes us tick. So after that really wonderful <laughs> bio, welcome to tonight's program, Danielle. It's so nice to have you here. Yes, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. We uh, we chatted earlier about our mutual love of cats. And I think that people who love cats and books, 
it's kind of telling, you know, those are some of your best qualities if you're a Catholic <laughs> lover. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, you have set like a short sort of presentation prepared for us to share some of the highlights from your book. Um, so what I'm going to do is let you kind of take the, the controls so that you can share your screen and I'll be backstage, but should you need me for anything, just give a shout and I'll hop back in. And, um, as folks are listening, if you have comments, reactions to what Danielle's talking about, please enter them into the chat. Questions, we can certainly come back to them um, at the end of her presentation. So don't be shy. Great. Right. And certainly also, if anything goes haywire on your with the technology, like put that in the comments as well. And we're monitoring it. And we'll, well, the, the Yellow Farmhouse people will deal yeah, with you it. You just sit back and share your knowledge and we'll handle the technology. Right. All right. So. All right. So. I am going to go over it's some of it's it's kind of the highlights of the book but it's really more than that uh the the framework of the book like the basic premise to help people understand what I'm talking about. So I in my experience when I started talking to people about home economics, you know, this what do people think that home economics is? I think this is what people think. You know, they think that it is 50s housewife. She's in a perfect apron over her dress. She's obviously blissfully happy to just be taking care of her home and her children and her husband. She has a terrific Pyrex bowl. Um, she doesn't work. She doesn't have a job outside the house. And, you know, the, the depressed version of this, right, is the sort of madman image of the, you know, the feminine mystique women who are, you know, taking pills and alcoholics and in despair over their wasted potential. And that's what people think of when they think of home economics. But this is the reality. Uh, this, in fact, it's the photo from the cover of my book and is a photo that I really like went to the mat to make sure got on the cover of the book. This is Dr. Flemmy Kittrell. She was a university dean of home economics at several black universities. She was an international nutrition educator and education consultant. She was the first black woman to earn a doctorate in nutrition. She was also the first black woman to earn a doctorate at Cornell University. She, well, she was, I mean, she was a pioneering scientist and a real world traveler who helped found schools of home economics in India and in various countries in Africa. She never married. She never had children, though she was very involved in the lives of her nieces. And, you know, she was a, a working woman, a working educated woman. So pause, you know, a little about me the, beyond my bio. I mean, the key thing here is, well, twofold. One is that my mother uh, was a business home economist. When I was a kid, I totally forgot about that until I was like six months into the project. Uh, but most importantly, here are my cats. Uh, that is Alexander on the top being very helpful, as Malcolm on the bottom being even more helpful. Uh, they both have been fed early so that hopefully they will not uh, be causing too much trouble. So, you know, to go over the framework, home economics was created by career women to empower other women. It was create, and it was gonna empower women through two prongs. One was to bring science and technology into the home so that women could get their work done more quickly and have time for whatever it is that they wanted to do, whether that be have an outside job, spend time with their children, get more education, become involved in civic affairs, garden, anything, just so they weren't, weren't spending all of their time in drudgery. That was the big word. Uh, and the other was to create a career field where women would be accepted because these careers were tied, how, in some cases, kind of tangentially, to jobs that women had traditionally done in the home. So home economics was not, or not just, trapping women in the kitchen. Instead, it was redesigning the kitchen through science to reduce physical strain. It, it, yes, people did sew aprons, but more than that, it was setting manufacturing standards for fabric so that shoppers wouldn't get shortchanged. Um, 
it was not done entirely by white women. It was done by women of all races. It was not about baking sourdough bread. This is something that was really interesting, right? Because uh, I was finishing the book during the first year of the pandemic and people were saying to me like, oh, all of this, you know, home-baked bread, isn't this so home i I'm like, I said, well, no, not really. Because, you know, while they appreciate, I mean, they, first of all, they did scientific experiments to do test the differences between breads made with different, with different kinds of methods and cakes made with cake mixes versus from scratch. And they looked at the value of a women's time, right? They thought it was perfectly fine to buy bread at the store if that's what worked for your schedule. And they also worked in to make sure that those commercial bakeries were going to have good working conditions for the women who did have those jobs. And also simply, it wasn't wrapping bows around mason jars. I just always think of the bows around the mason jars. It, you know, it wasn't this sort of twee decorative look of hominess. It was about creating jobs. Uh, and in fact, a quote from one of the early home economists, Carolyn Hunt, this is one of my favorites. She said, you know, the, thinking about home economics being this image that we have of it being this sort of DIY crafty in, endeavor. The woman who today makes her own soap instead of taking advantage of machinery for its production enslaves herself to ignorance by limiting her time for study. Uh, and actually, after the book was at some point after the book was done, I uh, knitted some dishcloths for my agent and I sent them to her with this on the card. So some of the accomplishments that home, ec home economists have, well, have had over the years, and this is an extremely partial list. They helped families survive scarcity and malnutrition, World War I, the Great Depression, World War II, they were in the thick of it, helping people save resources and eat well on the cheap. They were early radio pioneers. There were, there were enormous numbers of homemaking radio shows early on. They professionalized childcare. They created nursery schools and like labs, nursery schools and universities to train educators on how to, uh, how to take care of small children in a, you know, scientific way that spurred their development. They created nutrition labeling. They created school lunch. They created the five food groups. At one point, there were seven food groups. They standardized women's clothing sizes. I mean, for a while, that to be sure, that did not last. But for a while, there were standardized women's clothing sizes and children's clothing sizes. Uh, and they developed the Toll House cookie and the Rice Krispie treat. Uh, yes, Ruth Wakefield, who you know ran the Toll House Inn, she had a degree in home economics. Hotel management, restaurant management, those were fields that you could go into with a home economics degree. And, you know, the tangential connection to women's traditional jobs is like, oh, the woman manages the household. So this is just sort of a big, bigger household with, you know, more tables in it. So to go over some of the, the timeline and some of the heroines from early on in the field, to give you guys both a sense of the trajectory and just, you know, a taste of some of the women who are in the book. So home economics started in 18, the early 1840s. And it was the work of this woman, Catherine Beecher. Uh, Catherine, if you think Beecher, of course, is a familiar sounding name, she was indeed the sister of Harriet Beecher Stowe of Uncle Tom's Cabin. But her whole family was this famous group of preachers and intellectuals and eventually abolitionists. And she was a pioneering women's educator, uh, though she started uh, and ran some early high schools for women, which was something that you know didn't exist. It's really, I was shocked even after a number of years of covering education at how little formal schooling there was for anybody uh, in the 1830s. And certainly, you know, almost, there was almost no schooling for children who were black or who were not white, uh, and girls, there was very little schooling for girls. And even the school, you know, schooling was an elite endeavor. And Catherine Beecher created women's schools that were also elite, but she began thinking, and she, this was after she had 
kind of got kicked out of some of the schools that she had founded because she and her and her father were both uh, quite difficult to deal with. She started thinking about housekeeping and about the doctrine of separate spheres, right? Which is this idea that women's place is in the home. And she ended up saying that housework was too important to be left to mothers. It was a serious subject that deserved serious study that required brain power. She also thought that women's role mattered more, that, you know, because women were raising the, the future citizens, women were, you know, creating the democracy by bringing up the children. And so she wrote this book, The Treatise on Domestic Economy, which is huge. And part of it is, most of it is how to on everything from, I mean, she's got like home medicines, she has ventilation in the house, which was a big fixation of early home economists, which, you know, come COVID, I suddenly seemed relevant again. She looked at your circulation system. She was also a pioneer of physical education. She thought that all girls should get exercises and do calisthenics. And, you know, she just wrote in this laudatory way about these traditional fem feminine pursuits. Uh, but at the same time, here's the thing. Like, she did not practice what she preached. She never married. She was a career woman. She had no children. Uh, she, and it was just, it was the first, The I think the reason that matters, in part just to show, right, that home economics is not about being a housewife, but also this, I was trying to remember where I read something about that said, like, if, if, if homemaking came so naturally to women, would our society have to press so, push so hard on women taking those roles and doing those jobs? And I think she just shows, like, she didn't think that, she thought that mothers weren't qualified to teach homemaking of, and keeping your house. And she thought that, you know, it was this, this early illustration of this breakdown between this idea that that's natural for women and the fact, the reality of it not being natural for anybody. So jump forward, uh, the next big character, and really, I mean, one of the, the most important women in the story is Ellen Swallow Richards, who was the first woman to attend MIT. That is her. She was also the first woman to be a professor at MIT. And there she is, you know, standing out uh, like a sore thumb. So this is now, you know, a generation later. Oh, I should also mention, uh, Catherine Beecher's book sold, was a bestseller. It sold for generations. And it established homemaking, you know, how, how she called it domestic economy as being a subject of study. So Ellen Richards, we are now post world, uh, post the civil war. And you have this explosion of education for all of these people who are not part of the education system and especially of college education. So you had schools of engineering, such as MIT, you had women's colleges, such as Vassar, you had what are now called HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities. You had colleges, you had land grant universities out in the West, which, you know, includes what is the Midwest, right? For pe rural people, for farmers, future farmers and farm families. And Ellen was a scientist. She went to Vassar. She didn't go, Vassar wasn't open when she was our traditional college age. And she just studied on her own for years until there was a university that she could go to. She studied chemistry. She loved it. She loved it. The fact that it was uh, science that affected the real world, as opposed to her first love, which was astronomy. Uh, and afterwards, she was desperate to get more education, but she couldn't find any place that was going to bring let a woman study chemistry. Uh, and she applied to uh, MIT, and even though they didn't take women, and she got lucky, and it turned out that the dean was interested in co-education, and he let her attend, though basically she was just sort of auditing everything. He didn't charge her. She was in the, had this sort of weird in-between status. And she got a bachelor's degree in chemistry from MIT. She also got a simultaneous master's from Vassar. 
And for the first, you know, 10 years or so of her career in the 1870s, she was a chemist. She was a public health chemist. She studied the water supply. She was an industrial chemist. She studied arsenic and wallpaper, worked for a fire insurance company. But then her interests really took a turn. She was already working really hard to help other women become educated in science. And she was in her lab one day and the Boston school superintendent came by to look and he said like, oh, well, what good do you think that will do women in the kitchen? And, you know, he was just being dismissive, but she thought about it. She thought, well, what good will this do women in the kitchen? And she is really the one who brought, who had that vision of science for the common good, for improving people's lives, for empowering consumers, for helping people live better lives in her own house. Like she, she tested all sorts of things. Like she, she did tests on sweeping versus vacuuming. And so she adopted a vacuum cleaner and she was, she, I mean, she loved ventilation, right? She was fascinated by nutrition and did a bunch of early work, you know, popularizing the calorie and protein counts. Like she was the person who created these like proto nutrition labels that are so familiar to us now that it's hard to remember how revolutionary they were to be able to look at and find out, you know, what nutrients were in your food. Uh, and she, yeah, you know, she was not, she was not romantic. Her, this, her vision is, you know, what are the essentials that must be retained in a house that is a home? And she was ready to throw out everything. She believed in cooperative housekeeping. She believed in takeout. She, in fact, opened uh, like a, I mean, I call it in the book because it really seems like this, like a proto Boston market uh, for, to show, so that working class people could go home from factories and pick up something healthy and inexpensive to feed their families so that instead of spending their time cooking, they could spend their time being with their families, uh, which, I mean, look, certainly still still a, a big question today. Uh, and she began working with some of the, the women and some of these other prongs that were coming together to create home economics. She worked with a uh, cooking school teachers. So there were these private cooking schools in the cities, mostly in Boston and in New, in, in New York, that were set up because household labor was going the way of the dinosaur, because you'd had the Industrial Revolution. And all of these women who had been household labor, you know, po pre-Civil War women who were enslaved in the South, in the North, these immigrant women, they all left household employment if they could, because it was, you know, incredibly long hours and you didn't, your time wasn't your own. And so you suddenly had these middle-class women who were, didn't have cooks. And so they had cooking classes for them. Uh, also at the same time, you had the land grant universities were dealing with what they were supposed to do to educate these farmers, you know, future farmers' wives, right? These farm daughters who are coming to these schools. Like, did, should they have this traditional elite education? Should they learn Greek? Or should they learn things that were more practical and applied to the work that they were actually going to be doing in the world? And so one of the options was what was then called domestic science. And they also taught them like they had stenography courses, but you know, a lot of the, some of it was, okay, you're going to be going back to a farm and running a farm household as well as working on the farm. And let's teach you how to do that. But then there were also job options, right? Like you could become a dressmaker or a milliner if you didn't want to work on the farm or you, if you weren't going to marry. And then the last prong of it was this woman. Well, what this woman represents. So in 1889, Margaret Murray, later Margaret Murray Washington, took a job at Tuskegee Institute. It's because the historically, these, these new black colleges had the exact same question of like, what are we going to teach people? And there was this enormous hunger in the black community for education now that it was finally legal. 
So you had a divide between people like W.E.B. Du Bois, who thought that Black people should be professionals and should have an education that was as, as elite as you were getting at Harvard. Uh, and then on the other hand, you had Booker T. Washington, who went to Hampton and then was, you know, opened, was a, I think you call like the founding principal of Tuskegee. Uh, and he thought more along the lines of the land grant universities that you should be teaching black people to be farmers, to be industrious and economically independent and self-sufficient and, and to work in the trades. And so Margaret Murray was a truly extraordinary person. She was born in Mississippi, uh, sometime around the end of the civil war. It's really not clear because she, uh, seems to, she seems to have lied about her age. Uh, but it's hard to tell whether it's by one year or like three years, but she was born to, nobody has found any support for this, but the story she always told is that she was biracial. She was born to a black washerwoman and an Irish railroad man who died or at any rate was gone when she was still pretty young. And a Quaker pair of siblings had come from the North to the South to help educate young black children. And they really took Margaret under their wing. She went to live with them. And when she was a teenager, they paid for her to go to Fisk in Nashville, which was where W.E.B. Du Bois was studying at the same time. And she, you know, she worked her way through. She taught school as soon as she was old enough. She, in fact, she had to borrow like a long skirt to go take the teaching examination. She had to work her way through high school and then college. Uh, but she, she made it. And she, I mean, she, she wrote these columns for the Fisk student newspaper on like culture and classical music. Like she became this, at a very young age, this like very cultured person which is something that she uh, took to Tuskegee. She started to Tuskegee Women's Club and I got to go there and like read the notes that the bullet, like the, the minutes that this club kept of these, you know, musical evenings that they would have where the members would like all play minuets and things like that. So Fisk was very much a, you know, an academic an intellectually academically inclined college. But she got a job teaching at Tuskegee. Uh, she was really taken by Booker T. Washington, uh, whose wife had just, second wife had just died. He had two very young children. Mm -hmm. And she went and soon embraced this perspective of the hand, the heart, and the head, that education had to bring these three components together. Uh, she soon also married uh, Booker T. Washington and held down the fort for him. And this is why this is why some of her paper, her letters, for instance, have survived because uh, Washington's secretary just archived everything. And so some of her love letters have survived, for instance. So she soon became the head of domestic science at Tuskegee and you've viewed it in this, this fascinating and wide ranging way. And her activities were wide ranging along with training women, you know, women students to work in laundries, to sew, to, you know, do all of these household trades she did all sorts of community outreach, what we now call extension. She and you know her, she roused her community to do this as well. She went out to a former plantation, which was now full of sharecroppers, these you know people who just had nothing, and helped them. You know, brought information to them on how to live healthier lives. She brought them. She offered classes for the community, uh, there, she called the mother's meetings in the town on Saturdays when women were coming in to do their marketing anyway. And she offered childcare and instructed them on these things as well. And, and she really believed that in creating, you know, this was a controversial endeavor in many ways. It was controversial 
because she, the, you know, the charge was like, are you training women to be maids and to be cooks? And she said that she, no, she was training them to be moral leaders. She thought that she, she genuinely believed that household education was the way to create self-respect and mi middle-class status for poor black people. And that first of all, that whites would respect them, but even if they didn't, they would respect themselves and have the tools to make a good life for themselves, which was of course a really, you know, that was politi that was a politically a big deal. This is, you know, right after the end of reconstruction and the start of Jim Crow and people are being lynched. Uh, and she was talking about self-sufficiency and moral uplift. So yeah, she wrote in one of her many writings, you know, that through home economics, the black woman will possess that wealth of character that will be the means eventually of dispelling the greatest barriers that may confront the race. And lastly, I think we're going to stop after this because I want to leave a lot of time for questions. So where did the home economics really kick off in it, you know, a big way? Where did these strands mostly come together? And that was in 1899 in Lake Placid, New York. Uh, that is Ellen in the middle, uh, the woman to her left in the pale jacket with, well, sorry, my left, her right, with very good posture is Annie Dewey. And at this conference, and for 10 years total, home economic, th these women who, Ellen and these women who worked in city cooking schools and in land-grant universities came together to really put their stamp on the field to codify it because they were concerned about like classes for, you know, school classes that were teaching fancy embroidery to little kids who lived in tenements, right? Like totally useless, like teach them how to sew clothing that they can wear. Don't teach them fancy work or, you know, similarly cooking classes that were all about like making fancy food as opposed to nourishing food that you could eat, you know, buy on a budget and cook quickly. And they were, you know, looking for respect and for power. They talked about how they were going to reach out to, you know, they were starting to make connections with the New York state government and with the, you know, fledgling USDA to get support from those places. And in fact, the reason they ended up at Lake Placid in the first place is, uh, because Ellen and some of her Boston compatriots were interested in cultivating Melville and Annie Dewey, who owned the place, who owned this resort, uh, because Melville was at that time state librarian of New York, and they had it was going to be easier to get this, like not only a home economics curriculum, but like the perfect model home economics curriculum that they would put together into the New York State school system because they were getting the state librarian involved. Uh, that, and they, they talked in the very first few minutes of the meeting, right? The first thing they did was they decided that the field should be called a home economics. Uh, and that they thought it would tie it to general economics, right? It, that it wasn't just household arts, it was a household, you know, it was economics. And that it would sound more serious and it would be able to find a place in universities where they thought it should be, you know, it, in all universities everywhere. And they said, you know, it was recommended that these colleges be shown the possibility of a new profession commanding adequate compensation, right? That this was going to be jobs for women, jobs that paid decently, uh, but, you know, there was one piece of this, this puzzle that was not in place, which is that they did not invite Margaret Murray Washington, and they definitely knew who she was. They didn't invite anybody from any black colleges. Lake Placid was segregated. The Deweys did not allow Jews. They did not allow African Americans. Uh, and, you know, this, unfortunately, really set the pattern for the field over most of the 20th century where you had these two, you know, you had this dominant white home economics project, but alongside it, you had this important but marginalized 
Black Home Economics Project as well. And for that, uh, with that, I am going to uh, stop doing the, the 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 monologuing and start doing the answering. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, I think those of you watching will agree that you know there is just so much to explore here. And I know from totally. having read the book that you are just you know scratching the surface of what you document uh, in the book. And as you were talking, I was kind of jotting notes and realizing that. Part of why this book was so interesting to me is, you know, the same reason why I think family and consumer science is such an interesting uh, field of study, discipline, because it includes so many things that I'm interested in, like education, food, gender right. studies, race relations. I mean, this history, um, you know, just it, it intersects so many interesting um, aspects of our history and culture. And so I'll start with just a few of the things that were um, in my head as I was reading, but I do encourage those of you who are watching tonight to share your questions as well. It could be something that you want to learn more about, you know, that Danielle mentioned, maybe one of the, the leaders that you found particularly interesting, um, she could speak to that or share your own experience because I'm seeing in the chat that many of you are um, current family consumer science teachers. So. Uh, as I was reading the book, I kind of picked up on these two perspectives um, mm -hmm. that <clears throat> were brought by either different leaders in the field, different people who are trying to shape the field, or perhaps at different times in its history, where on the one hand, there was this apparent movement to like liberate women from domestic work through technology, by opening up career opportunities so that they weren't, you know, having to make their own soap for example. Um, and that was sort of one driving force behind this, um, this field. And then on the other hand, there seemed to also be this desire to recognize and honor the importance of domestic work and women's work. Um, and you know, even Margaret Murray's quote that you had in the presentation kind of gets at that to some degree in that she believed that the domestic sphere was so important that it actually could uplift the race and you know i think in another part of the book we actually use the words like change the world through the home yeah. so can you speak to that sort of duality and do you think that those purposes are in conflict with each other that is a really good question and i honestly don't think anybody has asked me it before and in quite that way so i'd say that first the the framework to remember here is that home economists were incredibly pragmatic and they worked within the system. Uh, they, there were feminist writers at the time who basically thought we should blow everything up, mm -hmm. uh, including for instance, uh, Charlotte Perkins Gilman who wrote the yellow wall, yellow wallpaper. She wrote like, she wrote, uh, books about like feminist housekeeping. They were, you know, work that they weren't saying we're going to, they were, they wanted to get to have broad impact. They wanted to get into universities and they knew that in order to do that, you had to play along. Like mm -hmm. they were subverting channels that already existed. Right. So they weren't rejecting how they weren't rejecting housework ever. And actually Carolyn Hunt, you know, Carolyn Hunt really struggled because she was a little too radical. Mm. She uh, was Dean of Home Economics at I think it was the University of Wisconsin, may have been Minnesota, pretty sure it was Wisconsin. And she told them that they shouldn't have classes on cooking. They, or they shouldn't have culinary classes. They should be having classes on like, the philosophical questions of what makes a home a home and on like human interrelations and like an, on economics and how, you know, and she was fired rather. Mm -hmm. I mean, she forced to resign, right? Because they just, whereas, you know, Cornell was incredible, was had an incredibly successful home economics pro program. And not only did the women who ran that, you know, certainly agree to have all of these hands-on classes, but they also like, served as the on-call catering service for a while, mm -hmm. right? Which is so much like, you know, with like the woman being expected to bring the brownies to the meeting, right? So 
I think that there were a range of perspectives. I think that most of them genuinely did respect. I think many of them did genuinely respect the home. I think I would say that, and certainly as, as time went on the, the family, like there's a reason, I think it, you know, it's interesting that when the field chose to rename itself, it kicked the home part out of the name, but it, it called itself, you know, family and consumer sciences, right. Which is an attempt to embrace this, you know, progressive idea of home economics. But I think some some cases they were just realistic. Like they certainly thought that boys should take home economics too, but they knew that it was just there was no they were nowhere near a time when women weren't going to be the ones who were responsible for the home. So they might as they they needed to work with what was. Uh yeah, I think it, it I mean it must have varied person to person, right? Like some some women genuinely loved a lot of women, a lot of the home economists loved thinking about family. There are women who did economic studies around the economics of the family, right? These feminist economic studies back in the 20s and 30s. But some of them, you know, the, the business home economists, for the most part, they didn't do their own housework. They mm -hmm. didn't do their own cooking. They had there, they had a few of them were married to people who did it. Some one of the I talked to a woman who lived with her parents, you know, her, through her entire adulthood, and her mother did the cooking and the cleaning. So they didn't actually all respect it. And the, one of the Lillian Muller Gilbreth, who among other things was the mom and cheaper by the dozen, you know, one thing that she said in the speech, she said, We never like, she said, We well, considered our time too important to be used in the home. We were executives. So I think it is really interesting that they, but they, but they chose to focus on the work of the home. In some cases, it was definitely just like, that's where they could get work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I noticed as I was reading, I know I would mark it and say like, oh, interesting. She doesn't have children. Oh, interesting. She doesn't have children because it, it was kind of showing me like, it's really hard to do both. And so then there is in fact a, a section of the book that kind of speaks to that directly. Yeah. And I pulled out a quote and I promise I won't dominate this whole conversation, but I just have a lot of thoughts. Um, because, you know, this was, it came out of the section that I think is talking about like the 1970s and this is the time of women's movement. And there was some real overt criticism of the field from feminist leaders. Um, who some of whom I think changed their tune and maybe you can speak to that a little bit, but um, this came, this was a quote from a home economics professor. And he said that we've been teaching women that both careers and childcare, homemaking, two, two full-time jobs are their jobs. And if they cannot do both well, they are failures. We do not teach men the same things and neither does anyone else. And that yeah. issues around gender inequity feel just as relevant in 2023 as they did in 1971 or whenever this was, which unfortunately, yes, years ago. <laughs> um, so can you speak a little bit to that? And um, I'm reminded of Peggy Ann's comment here where she said she did her mm. master thesis on gender role differences. And, um, you know, that, that, that domestic work has to get done. Right? Yeah. So somebody has to do it. And so often it's the woman, whether she has a career or not. So could you right. speak to that? So yeah, that that comment came right in the the midst of the second wave feminist revolution after they had you know gotten their you know nailed to the wall by Robin Morgan at an American Home Economics Association conference where I might add like they had invited her to come and talk about feminism and gender roles like. She wasn't like it was this wasn't like the Miss America person. Not an right? Yeah. Yeah. She wasn't like showing up and protesting. She was invited to speak. Uh, and by that point, you know, they they thought that they were preparing women for dual roles. Right. So they thought by that point that they were preparing women to both take this is you know in the early 70s to take care of the house and to have a career. And it was that moment where they were starting to realize, first of all, like how the feminists had seen them. And second of all, the ways in which, and you know, so things had changed in the field after World War II, which 
not only do I go into the book, it takes like four chapters to deal with because like th that to me was like this big question of how did it go? How did things go south? Mm -hmm. But that's, they started questioning not only what they were doing, but the very grounds on which they were working, including just the fact that we don't teach men that they need to have two jobs and that they are two jobs. And I think by that point also, if just one last thing I want to say about your previous question, more recently, you know, since the 70s or so, home economics has been a field because it's been a field that people think is this like, you know, girly thing. It more, the people have gone into it more who are, I think, interested mm -hmm. in cooking and sewing and homemaking and teaching about it and the importance of the home. Right. So, so, but I, you know, and I think even more that this is sort of uh, rank theorizing here. Post-World War II, you do, I mean, you, on the one hand, you have women who are pushed back into the home to make so that the men can have the jobs back, but you also just have growing, growing employment of women outside the home. So there, I think there was more awareness of like, oh, here's all this work that it takes. Like you come home at the end of the day and like the kids are hungry and the house is a mess. Like somebody, like these are jobs that are necessary to the running of society. And one last comment is like, yes, so many of like, I mean, you couldn't have children and be a working white woman for in most fields, right? For decades, high K-12 school systems would fire teachers when they got pregnant. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, black in my lifetime at a Catholic school, yeah, yeah, it was still the policy. Yeah. But black home economists often were married. Uh, and sometimes they had children or sometimes they were like, you know, had stepchildren because it was always accepted in black communities that both spouses were going to have to work mm. for, for pay. Like it just wasn't an, like black men weren't paid the kind of wages that mm -hmm. would support a family. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, there's so much more to explore there, but um, Jen had made a comment that um, I think is is worth discussing, which is this um, tension between the purpose of family consumer science being about career readiness or life skills. Um, yes. Probably something that feels very relevant to the folks who are teaching family consumer science now. Yeah. Um, I know, you know, there's some talk in the chat about where the funding comes from and how that sort of shapes the field. Um, and it reminded me of this, this quote that I wrote down that said, whether or not this was someone sort of commenting on this, this tension, whether or not one ever entered a professional kitchen, she thought that everyone needed to learn to cook. If we don't teach our children how to cook, we turn them over to the machine that makes food. Yeah. Like <laughs> double yeah. underline for that one. Yeah. Um, but can you talk to that, uh, trend you know how has it changed over time where based on your research kind of where do things stand now what is the focus of family consumer science or what should it be yeah i think that that is a really astute observation and uh for those who work in the field i think you guys will all be really amused to know that one of my like notes to myself in my like you know guiding multi-tapped spreadsheet was basically, how can I write about Perkins without boring the pants off of everybody? <laughs> uh, Perkins being the bill that funds uh, career technical education. Uh, so one of the early things that home economists did in the 1910s was hitch their wagon to vocational education, which was just starting to get federal funding and got a big influx of federal funding in the 1910s. And in fact, the bill that is now Perkins. And, you know, and home economics was the only vocational program approved for women in early career tech education. And it, I think it has, it has grown more and more important. It provides only a really small percentage of the actual funding nowadays, but I think without Perkins, um, I think more school systems would be dropping 
family consumer sciences. It's it's that anchor. They're really clinging to it as this anchor. Uh, and in part, you know, so one of the things that was one of the real one one of the developments that really kneecapped the field was in the 80s, early 80s in the Reagan administration, they put out a report called The Nation at Risk that, you know, was one of those, you know, Americans are falling behind, Americans are falling behind, you know, chicken little. Yeah. Reports. The Russians, the Russians are beating us. Right. That then became the Japanese are beating us too. Like, you know, they, there was this, this, there have been many such reports. And they said that, well, school should be buckling down on the hard, on hard academics and they should be kicking out career classes that were, you know, preparation for careers or adulthood, mm -hmm. um, include driver, like driver's ed, right? Like why are we spending time doing driver's ed in school when the kids could be learning a foreign language or calculus? And the field really was never fully able to counter that. But over many decades, we have re-embraced career tech education. And this is one of those, like, I mean, it's the same debate that was going on between Washington and Du Bois. It is just one of those mm -hmm. oscillations in American education. And it's once and it's back and it changes every 10 years probably of what's the purpose of school, right? Is it to develop great citizens? Is it to get a job? Is it global com competition? Is it get a job? Mm -hmm. So schools, certainly in the last decade, there has been this revival of career technical education. And, you know, by the, by the time this was all going down, you couldn't say that, well, so many of women are going to spend their lives as wives and mothers as their work. So we need to be training them for that. Like that didn't, that was no, that no longer held true. But you can say like, well, they oh, still well, will. They'll, they'll just have a job also. Right. They'll also have a job on top of it. Right. <laughs> they'll just be doing the, the second shift as sociologist Arlie uh, Hochschild, Hochschild wrote like 35 or something years ago. Unfortunately, also still true. So I think it's a, I think it's a problem. I think that it is a problem because Within the field of career tech education, home economics pursuits don't do well by the standards because, and I, this is something I really did cover as an education reporter, because they're looking for jobs that are high, high wage and high demand. Mm. Home economics jobs are high demand and low wage for the most part. Culinary, early childhood education, social work, right? Like you can go broke really hard in any of these fields. So it's hard to prioritize sending kids to those classes, though they love them, right? Like the culinary is extraordinarily popular. Uh, but yeah, anyone who's worked in a kitchen knows most of the people working in the kitchen get paid bookies. So, yeah. but at the same time, you do have this demand from parents for kids to like learn adulting right? For everybody to learn how to take care of themselves. But it's just like the way the education dialogue is, it's really, really hard to say that it should be part of the school day, especially since we are so far past the time when home economics was like, you know, also included really heavy science. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You talk uh, toward the end of the book about in researching it, you know, how many people you spoke to classrooms you went to, you know, to do these observations and just hearing overwhelming support and enthusiasm for this coursework where, you know, where sometimes people would mistakenly say like, we should bring that back thinking that it wasn't around anymore. And that perhaps has to do with the name change, which we can talk about, but um, you know, that it seemed to be pretty universally popular. And I can see, you know, Sarah's saying in the chat that culinary classes are over enrolled and um, Rachel saying that they've seen That's an right. upsurge in numbers in textiles and fashion and right. interior design. So the demand is there. Um, so like what explains this conflict between apparent popularity among the general public mm -hmm. and then it's sort of lackluster image that might explain why it can't get the political support yeah. um, seen as serious work or important work. Yeah. Well, I think Sarah's comment 
like in the comments, like really hits the nail on the head that is that these are women's jobs. These are women's jobs and they are not respected and they are, you know, and also like some things feed on themselves, right? Like the, okay. So, okay. For instance, I had a, the family friend who got her library science degree, another traditional women's field PS the Dewey's highly involved uh, in the professionalization of library science. He, this is Dewey of the decimal system. Uh, same guy. <laughs> You know, she, her alma mater cut the library program because the alumni weren't giving enough money because society doesn't respect librarians enough to pay them enough that they can give donations, yeah. big donations to their colleges. Business school is doing very well. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> this PS was the Columbia Library School, which in fact Melville Dewey ran. Um, so... I think that there is just this enduring sexism that refuses to respect this work. And it, you know, is reflected in things like, where is the lobby? Like say, you know, pounding the pavement for home economics, like people are, you know, pounding the pavement for like, you know, shop class welding stuff. Right. And to top it all off, most lawmakers are men and most men have not taken home economics, even though it's been illegal since the seventies to gender segregate the class, but like still when it's not required, boys don't take it for the most part. I mean, like fewer boys take it. Right. And also boys are probably more boys are taking it now, but like the men in power, we're talking about people who have been taking it maybe in the eighties. Right. So they don't, these are men who have not been doing the housework for the most part. And I just thought it was so, and I do have some hopes that there is more awareness post pandemic, mm -hmm. given that, you know, the clo the schools closed and everything fell apart. And all of a sudden parents were working from home, many of them, and like seeing what's necessary to take care yeah. of children and a household. And, you know, maybe, you know, there's certainly been more talk around, like there's been better funding for preschool, for instance, right? With this awareness that like, oh my God, these are crucial. This is, you know, the workforce behind the workforce, as they call it. Mm -hmm. Right. We had this window into people's homes Mm -hmm. as never before and um, all these things that are so often invisible they just sort of get done without anyone noticing we're now like being seen and um or, and or falling apart yeah um, so perhaps that's a silver lining um i'm wondering if you could talk briefly about the name change because it's kind of you know i found myself in promoting the book the book is called the history of home economics right we use the term family consumer science or fcs and so then i was wondering like, do I need to explain to people when I say FCS, do they know what that means? People in the general public probably don't, but at home ec isn't what it's called anymore. So can you talk a little bit about how that change happened? And mm -hmm. you have an opinion about it. And I, I do have an opinion about, it, which I just want to say it was an opinion that was like created by a great deal of observation. Like I did not have this opinion going going in. So the name change, what happened in the early nineties, and it was, you know, a decision try it, I is very understandable why they changed the name, which was that people didn't respect home economics and they were trying to get respect. And they thought if they changed the name to emphasize, you know, to make it sound more professional and more educated. I mean, it's the same thing as 1899 at the Lake Classic concert. Yeah, they rebranded to just say like, oh, we want this to be to show that to, the name to show that it's a field that shouldn't be dismissed. Uh, the problem being that just, it, you know, it really hasn't like it's just never caught on. Uh, and. Like I had again, like I have been covering education for like four years when I even started thinking about this book. I had and including career tech education, I had never heard the phrase family and consumer sciences. I had never heard the acronym FACS or FCS. And I was living in Louisiana, which like still has it. Um, but, you know, at the same time, like they were, the field was being disempowered in some key ways, right? Like they were, they, at some time in the nineties, uh, there stopped being a home economics coordinator at the U S department of education. 
So like that incredibly important position was gone. There have stopped being people in charge in many of the states. So it's not like anybody even like the name has gone underground. And just uh, the anecdote, and you, anyone who's an FCS teacher has experienced this any number of times, like last, ah, gosh, early summer, I think it was, I was, uh, I, I was going to speak at a conference of family consumer science teachers in the Midwest. And I was, you know, got, had gotten them the night before and people were at the hotel bar as they are. Right. And so these, you know, women who were there for the conference were there and the bartender said, Oh, what do you guys do? And they said, Oh, and these two younger women is like, Oh, you know, we're, we're teachers of family and consumer science. And he said, what's that? And they said, Oh, well, it's what used to be called home economics. <laughs> And it just happened over and over and over again. So like, yes, I couldn't call the book Family Consumer Sciences because the general public just doesn't know what it is. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I do think they should just change the name back. Like I respect the reasons why they tried it, but I mean, apart from it being kind of a mouthful, just I, all over mm -hmm. the teachers are explaining anyway, like, oh, it used to be home, called home economics. Yeah, and, so, and you make the interesting point that emphasizing family as opposed to home is potentially less inclusive that, you know, not everybody's thinking about having a family needing children, but that everyone we hope has a home and that there's a lot of work that goes into maintaining a home that is perhaps more universal. Um, I thought that was an interesting point. Yeah. Apparently this is a discussion in Sweden, which PS, if anybody want, knows anybody who oh. wants to invite me to speak in Sweden, I would really love to go uh, where they, their name is something closer still to like something translates out to like something with the word home in it. And you know, that said, people, you know, there are many kinds of family. There are, you know, chosen family. There's lots. But for most of us, I think that the gut reaction of family is the nuclear family. Yeah. And that a lot of the content that falls under family consumer science has to do with the home. Well, I mean, of course, you're feeding your family, but, you know, cooking, textiles, this cleaning, the things that, that, that people were working on that really was focused on how you do this work, this domestic work. Yeah, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of it is really, you know, does not, some of it is about raising children, but a lot of it, you know, whatever the complement of people living in one particular home, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. And even, you know, even the, in the 60s and 70s, especially, there was a really big emphasis on interpersonal relations within the mm -hmm. family. But, you know, hey, interpersonal relationships, anyone who's ever had a roommate, man, interpersonal relationships with roommates just as hard as mm -hmm. partners and children. Fair enough. Um, I want to um, bring this comment in. Jen posted it, but on behalf of someone else, uh, she, he or she, they ask, what do you see as the relationship between home economics and race, um, which comes up at several points and in different ways in the book. Um, you know, there were parts in like the story of the development of mm -hmm. home ec in which people were excluded because of their race, you know, mm -hmm. not given a seat at the table among those leaders shaping the field because of their race. Um, people working in communities of a different race and kind of figuring mm -hmm. out those dynamics. So uh, there's a lot to explore here. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really, it's really a complicated question. Um, so I don't know that I have seen the full extent that there is to see, given that, you know, this question, like I observed some classrooms that were really multiracial, uh, that were, you know, I sort of classroom taught by a black woman, right? And I don't know the full extent of what those relationships are like. I can say that the field is definitely like far different from where it was. Uh, the black home economists, like in particular, uh, home economics is really well rooted at a lot of historically black universities. That is still a big, like a significant amount of activity is coming from those schools. Yeah. Uh, they've gotten certainly you know, night and day on things like what kind of recipes you're cooking in classes, right? Mm -hmm. Like they have gone very consciously to really broaden the spectrum. So it's not just this like Anglo middle class yeah. cooking, but it's 
cooking that you know spans a range of cultures and ethnicities. Uh, so, and and you know the 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 field is is very conscious of diversity and equity and inclusion. Um, I will. I mean, in general, they're a little less political. Like certainly the the organization formerly known as the American Home Economics Association is much overtly, much less overtly political than it was in the 70s. Late 70s, they were, you know, passing resolutions in favor of the ERA. And they mostly tried to like be careful on the political front now. But for instance, you know, back a few years ago, they passed some kind of resolution and there was there was argument over how sharply it was going to be worded and some people thought it didn't go far enough, but they condemned uh, family separation at the border. Yes, I remember that. Because, you know, they were saying, you know, they were saying that maybe they are, you know, we're an association that supports families and togetherness and this mm -hmm. is appalling. Um, I noticing con uh, comments in the chat and then also kind of you're speaking to kind of how things have changed and where the state of the field is now. So I'm, I'm wondering if you could kind of give us a sense for your thoughts on the future of FCS. Um, I think Sylvia asked that early on and Jen also asked uh, sort of a more specific version of that, which is uh, which institutions do you think are positioned to serve as a platform for the next wave of this uh, movement? So Based on your research and the people you've been speaking to, where do you see family consumer science going? I am really not sure because I, I, I do think that somebody somewhere, like if somebody somewhere could just hire a really good lobbyist mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that on the, for the federal level, like that, that might do something. Um, there's a lot of activity, like the, the FCCLA, the organization formerly known as the Future Homemakers of America, like they have a day where they bring young people to meet their Congress, their lawmakers in DC and like advocate. And that's great. But, you know, I think it's also very easy for lawmakers to look at like things that teenagers are advocating for as like, oh, isn't that cute? You like, right. you, you exactly. wonderfully involve children. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that it would be enormously helpful to just have it made mandatory in more states. And so the, there's political organizing to be done at the state level, certainly. It just, it's a, it's a challenging question in that it is so like the comp, like at, as, as when I first was, was thinking about that and I, look, if I had the solution to this sort of thing, maybe I wouldn't be a journalist, maybe I'd be doing something else. But, you know, as someone who covered education for eight, nine years, it it's so hard to change how we do school. Yeah. And well, I mean, giant international pan pandemics aside, right? But it's hard to change things when there isn't a pandemic. So like trying to to make that case against this ongoing, like, gotta not let whatever country, yeah, gotta mm -hmm. catch the rest of the country, the rest of the world, Americans are so far behind. Like it, and you know, I was covering New Orleans primarily, where there, are, you know, any number of ninth graders who can't read. So it is hard to, I, it's it's hard to make that case, I think. But it is also the fact that parents really want it, and it just feels like there needs to be more support for. You know, there there are there's so many jobs open for mm -hmm. teachers, mm -hmm. but at the same time, home economics education programs continue to shrink and get closed. Right. So, yeah, I, I I wish I knew what the what the solution is for things like for home economics taking again, you know, it's, you know, rightful, rightful seat at, the, well, I suppose at the table, so to speak, but I do know that it isn't just, it shouldn't just, it, it shouldn't just be about like, it's not going to, I don't know if anything's going to change through like teachers tweeting mm. with various hashtags, you know, photos from their classroom. I think it is 
a much bigger question of like, how do we raise children and what's important for yeah. what we think is important for society? And hey, look, maybe now we have an opportunity in terms of, you know, I still, th I still think that all sorts of currents are active that make it an obvious answer, right? There's so much interest in career technical education, mm -hmm. farm to table, yeah. in eating better, in health and wellness and mental health, right? So, you know, ch thinking about children's mental health post pandemic, things like that. Wellness. But yeah, some really, so some more, and yeah, you know, there are some brilliant strategists within the field mm -hmm. who are, who are, and who have some great ideas. You know, we we don't expect you to have it all figured out because these are, as we said, really complex questions about you know how how what what do kids need? Yeah. <laughs> what do people need? You know, that's really what it comes down to, and all of this debate kind of swirls around that core question that right. has been debated throughout the history of home economics and throughout right. formal schooling. Um, right, and again, some of it on the other side of things, right on the like career tech education side, geez, if we paid, you know, if we can get more funding for preschool at, for early childhood educators, then it becomes a higher, you know, a less low wage, high demand field. And then there is more reason to be right. encouraging students to pursue their interests there. Yeah. And that's not just good for the teachers, but good for the students in those classrooms and good for the parents bringing the students yeah. to those classrooms and so on and so on. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is a conversation I could continue to have, <laughs> but I'm mindful of the time. Um, and I know that we are going to be able to continue this conversation on mm -hmm. Saturday as well at our next program. So I'm going to mention that a bit more. Um, Danielle, I'm going to let you go. Thank you right. so much for your time tonight and for your knowledge and sharing all of this really fascinating history with us. Um, yes, thank you for having me. I hope that you guys all enjoy the book and the class and that you're, you know, yeah, nah, always happy to answer questions if people have them. Yes, if you have more questions, you can continue to put them in the comments. Um, maybe we'll catch a few more. Um, but you can also find Danielle at this uh, handle, which is good for Twitter and Instagram. I think it's the yes. same. Um, and she also has a website where you can contact her, thedailyreason.com and find uh, links, of course, to the book, but also to her other writing. So check that out. Mm -hmm. um, Danielle, thanks again. And um, we hope to speak with you again. Great, right, thank you. All right, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, we do have a second part to this program and um, you can read more about it and register on our website, yellowfarmhouse.org. We're gonna be at Stonington High School on Saturday the 4th at 2 p.m. Um, and we're doing a cooking class, which is going to be facilitated by three local FCS teachers. And um, we're going to be making just to, in case you're not convinced yet that you should sign up for this um, free class, we're going to be making a um, seasonal salad with a homemade vinaigrette, a um, kelp pasta, so homemade kelp noodles with um Oh gosh, now I'm going to have to pronounce this live. Cache y pepe. I'm Italian. This is humiliating. Cache y pepe sauce um, and a chocolate beet cake with goat cheese frosting. So um, this will give us a chance to see what a culinary classroom in a modern American high school looks like, um, to experience it for yourself if you haven't, or if you're teaching in another district and, and want to see how some of your peers run a classroom, uh, and then just join this conversation about the past um, and the future of home economics and family consumer science. So if you have questions about the program, you're welcome to email us at info at yellowfarmhouse.org. We hope that you follow us at Yellow Farm CT. We, as I mentioned earlier, offer professional development for family consumer science teachers, both virtual um, programs like these, and then also in-person workshops on the farm where we get out onto the farm and um, plant or harvest together and then always uh, cook and enjoy meals together. So we hope to see many of you on Saturday at the program and to hear from you um, soon. Thanks very much for your time tonight.